I wouldn't necessarily come out and say that I'm in direct opposition to this. I think it's just important to add supplemental facts to everything and to provide historical background because um, I don't think there's anyone who should be able to get offended at straight facts. Um, so we're out here with science just to show people some of the history that's erased in a lot of the memos. Welcome everybody. My name is Andy Ngo and I'm one of the student leaders of Freethinkers of Portland State University. Please silence your mobile devices. Tonight, our panel will talk about diversity. The Freethinkers are committed to dialogue, conversation, open inquiry, and free expression. These are cornerstones of liberal democracy and they are principles we hold ourselves to. We are also committed to having and hosting difficult conversations, even when they may make people uncomfortable. But that's more, not less reason to have these discussions. If you're interested in learning more about the free thinkers, please visit our Facebook group page. I also wrote a column that was published in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that detailing some of the abuse and violent threats that our group has endured for putting on this event. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brett Weinstein. Dr. Weinstein is an evolutionary biologist, free speech advocate, esteemed public intellectual, and professor in exile. Please welcome him. Thank you, Andy. Uh, hello, Portland. Um, let me say, this is an unusual spot for me to be in. Usually, I'm on the hot seat. Um, not tonight. Tonight, I get to introduce the panel, which is a position of luxury, comparatively speaking. Um, but I also get to take care of some business that I think we need to address if this is going to, to work out to all of our benefit. There is, of course, a lot of protest surrounding tonight's panel. And because they never cease to plan these things publicly online, there is also apparently uh, a walkout that is planned for this evening that will, of course, disrupt the panel and confuse things. And I would like to invite those who are intending to walk out to reconsider. Um, in order to make it clear why I think you should, I want to tell you uh, maybe it's an anecdote. For my whole adult life, I have been attending talks. Some of them are from people that I agree with, some of them are from people I disagree with. And sometimes I think the people that I'm listening to are actually a bit dangerous. When that happens, I have uh, something I do, which is I sit in the audience and I listen carefully to what they are saying and I try to formulate a question, one sentence, at most two sentences, that will reveal the hypocrisy. If you're planning to walk out, I would argue that that is a cowardly move. You will do nothing important by walking out other than having taken up seats that might have been occupied by somebody who was interested in listening to what the panelists had to say. I would suggest instead of walking out, what you do is you formulate that devastating question and then deliver it in the Q&A. If you're right, it will have a pretty interesting effect, I promise you. If I'm right that the panelists are actually making important points and that they're ones that are well worth all of our consideration, you'll discover that too. So, let me now introduce the panelists. First panelist is Professor Heather Hying. Heather Hying happens to also be my wife. She is an evolutionary biologist who, for 15 years, taught at the Evergreen State College and resigned in light of protest this last spring. Uh, her work on the sex lives of poison frogs in Madagascar earned her the highest dissertation award that the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor has uh, to offer. Heather, I should also point out on a personal note, is a dyed-in-the-wool tomboy. I've known her for 30 years and that's how she's been for that entire period of time. So, from the point of view of somebody speaking about sex and gender, she's in a pretty interesting position. She has achieved within science and she has lived a life in which she has accomplished many things that are traditionally in the male venue. The next panelist is Helen Pluckrose. She's an author, and commentator who writes on feminism, intersectionality, and postmodernism. She's a regular contributor to Conatus News and to ARIO Magazine, for which she also acts as an assistant editor. I will also tell you that 
Last night, for the first time, she had tacos. <laughs> she ate them without apparently any fear of being accused of cultural appropriation. So, um, the, uh, the interviewer this evening is Peter Bogosian. Peter Bogosian is a full-time professor here in the Department of Philosophy at Portland State University. He's an international speaker uh, for the Richard Dawkins Foundation and for the Center for Inquiry. He has an extensive publication record across multiple domains of thought, and he is the author of the Manual for Creating Atheists and the creator of the Atheos app. Peter has also, with James Lindsay, written a recent paper on the conceptual penis. Um, I would recommend this paper to anyone who has male genitalia or knows somebody who does. It's fascinating. <laughs> right, male genitalia, exactly. What? Oh, no. <laughs> um, my suggestion, if you don't know what male genitalia is, is that you get a subscription to Google and look it up. All right. So, um, the last panelist really needs no introduction. He is James Damore. He was uh, a programmer who famously worked at Google, and uh, as he was put through his paces over diversity and equity questions, wrote a internal memo uh, that said a lot about what uh, is likely the root cause of um, unequal numbers of males and females in engineering positions at Google. He was fired for doing so. Now, I would point out there's a bit of confusion that we are liable to run into here, which is that there are really two James Demores. There's the James Demore that we have here on the panel. He's a very sweet, decent human being. And then there is the phantom James Demore that wrote some terrible misogynistic memo that accused women of not having the capacity to do engineering well. He is not here this evening. So I suggest that we um, treat the James Demore and the other panelists with respect, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what I'm sure will be a marvelous discussion. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. We have a full house tonight. Is that better? No? It's not better? It's, it's a little, it's a little creepy. But how's that? Is that good? Okay, thanks. So we invited every member, every tenure and tenure track member of the Women's Studies Department to be here with us tonight on stage with James DeMore and myself to have a conversation. Not a debate, but a conversation. In my opinion, much of the confusion surrounding the issues of the memo and the wider issues in society emanate directly from the corpus of literature coming from gender studies. I think we need to have conversations about these issues, and I think these conversations matter. My offer to have the conversation still holds. In fact, James Lindsay, Helen Pluckrose, and myself will be speaking in Kramer Hall, room 71, Monday evening, about intersectionality. And we would invite this, the same invitation again, any and every member and all the members of the Women's Studies Departments, the tenure and tenure track faculty, to sit alongside us and have a conversation about issues that matter to us. I think it's important and I think that that conversation needs to occur because much of the confusions that have come around these issues about diversity and gender, we can preempt these and we can talk through our problems. So, uh, so James, a lot of folks here to see you tonight and hear your story. So in your own words, tell me, br bring us through what happened. Yeah. So I had been working at Google for about four years, and I noticed that we had some inclusion problems on our team. Some people wouldn't go to our group lunches or speak up in our team meetings. So I went to a diversity and inclusion conference at Google. Unfortunately, rather than talk about how to you know, really include everyone on the team, it just talked about diversity, 
and specifically racial and di uh, gender diversity at Google. And they said, you know, the population has 50% women, Google has 20% women, therefore sexism. And that was really how deep their argument went. And so they went through all these different things like microaggressions and unconscious bias. And they said, that is why we only have 20% women. And after that, they asked for feedback. And you know, I had actually been doing biology in grad school before going to uh, Google. And I knew a little bit about psychology and actually why uh, women might not be, or why there may be fewer women interested in tech. And so I wrote this, uh, the document, and I really explained, okay, these factors we have to take into account if we want to change Google to make it more appealing to more women, and how we could actually uh, fix some of these workplace issues and remove gender from the discussion and just say, okay, some people have different personalities and that affects some of these dynamics. And were they happy about that memo? Uh, so I, I sent it to Is HR and HR just ignored it. Uh, these diversity programs just ignored it. They read it, but never re responded. And then I had some one-on-one -on -one conversations. Those were actually civil. Uh, but then you know, a manager uh, told me, OK, I should send it to this other group. So I, it's called Google's Ideological Echo Chamber. And so I asked them, OK, what do you think about this document? Am I just in my own echo chamber, or is there actually something here? And it just exploded from there. It went viral within the company. And uh, this was Wednesday night. And then it, uh, it leaked to the public on Saturday. Of 2017. Yeah, so last year. And then that following Monday, uh, well, so once it leaked out, all the top executives were sending out these disparaging emails about just how harmful it is. Don't read it. This is not what we stand for. And you know, part of the issue is that this was actually criticizing some of the policies of the company. And it was really a whistleblower document because at this conference, they talked about how we're discriminating during hiring. And that's illegal. Uh, so uh, the top executives were saying, no, don't look into this. Don't look into this. Don't discuss this. And uh, then uh, on Monday, they called me up and said, hey, James Moore, you know, you're fired for perpetuating gender stereotypes. Wow. Wow. They called you at home on the phone. Yeah, I had been at home because I received some violent threats from coworkers. From your coworkers? Yeah. Google. Uh, so it's very interesting. I'm curious, how many people here have read the memo? God, I love Portland. I love Portland State. Awesome. That's fantastic. Thank you for reading the memo. So here are some media headlines. Tech bro fired from Google for saying women are biologically unfit to be engineers will speak at PSU next month, with the subline being, James Damore will answer questions about <laughs> his opinions on diversity and presumably why he thinks women can't do math. <laughs> that was from our very own Willamette Week. Here's another one. G quote, a Google engineer said that women may be genetically unsuited for tech jobs, unquote. That's from none other than the Washington Post. The final one is from Time Magazine. Quote, Google has fired the employee who wrote an anti-diversity tirade, report says. So just so that we can have a reality check, here's what the memo actually says verbatim. Here are the first two sentences of the memo. Quote, I value diversity and inclusion. I'm not denying that sexism exists and don't endorse using stereotypes. When addressing the gap in representation in the population, we need to look at population level differences and distributions. If we can't have an honest discussion about this, then we can never truly solve the problem. You write that, James? Yeah. Okay. And then later on in the memo, three sentences, in only a few sentences down, you write, quote, I hope it's clear that I'm not saying diversity is bad that Google or society is 100% fair, that we shouldn't try to correct for existing biases, or that minorities have the same experience of those in the majority. 
My larger point is that we have an intolerance for ideas and evidence that don't fit a certain ideology. I'm not saying that we should restrict people to certain gender roles. I'm advocating for quite the opposite. Treat people as individuals, not just a member of the group. Is that, did you write that, James? Yeah. All right, so let's talk, before we launch into this, I want to talk about some definitions. I want to give some workable definitions for all of us, and we can just use these now as placeholders and come back to those later on. We can revise those. So Helen, how would you define, briefly, how would you define diversity? Diversity at its most basic simply means a variety of differences. Can you get closer to the mic? Yeah, so it just simply means a variety of differences. So when we're talking about diversity of people, we have to ask diversity of what? Are we talking about diversity of ideas? Uh, what has been known as the marketplace of ideas when knowledge and human rights have advanced considerably? Or are we talking about diversity of identity, which is much more commonly found to be the case now, in which people are considered to think and feel in certain ways consistent with their gender, race, or sexuality, which has an obvious connection to stereotyping. All right, well, one, I'm gonna push back on you a little on that because uh, my own opinion is that diversity is a Trojan horse for a political agenda, but... <laughs> you ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> So Hel Helen, how, a couple more terms so that we can really seat this conversation so we're all on the same page. How would you define inclusion? Well, inclusion is great. Everybody wants to be included. We all want to feel as though we are including everyone. But what, again, what are we talking about with inclusion? Are we talking about including women with voting? Are we talking about including people of color in all professions, same-sex couples in marriage? Or are we going by this sort of new definition where we think that people can be excluded or marginalised, erased or even rendered unsafe by hearing discourses which don't comport with intersectional feminism. In that case, inclusion becomes more like exclusion of any other ideas. Right. Great. We're on the same page. And the final one, just so that we can all be on the same page, is that Social constructivism, James used in the memo that the vast majority of people here have read Portland. Uh, you used social constructivism or some variant thereof. Could you just briefly, what is social constructivism? Well, social constructivism or cultural constructivism are often referred to as blank slateism. And if anybody hasn't read Stephen Pinker's book, The Blank Slate, I really recommend it to understand this. It's the idea that all of our traits, our characteristics, abilities, cognitive, psychological, behavioural, are learned from societal norms. The idea that there can be innate or biological or inherited differences are, are dismissed. And so we're in a position where if there is injustice or an if there is an imbalance anywhere, uh, uh, sort of an inequality of representation, the only explanation for that can be that there is societal injustice. All right, thanks, I appreciate that. So that, that leaves us wide open. Heather, you are an evolutionary biologist. What can we take from, from what Helen said to help us make sense of James's memo? James argues, accurately, that there are differences between men and women. This is a strange position to be in, to be arguing for something that is so universally and widely accepted within biology. What is not as widely accepted is that culture is also evolutionary, but I'm gonna argue that biology and culture are both evolutionary. Let's look at differences between men and women that are explicitly anatomical and physiological. Are men taller than women on average? Does anyone take offense at that fact? <laughs> Are you irritated? There's so, always a stand up. <laughs> so I would say you could be irritated by it. You could be irritated by the fact that women have to be the ones to gestate and lactate. You could be irritated by a lot of truths. But taking offense is a, is a response that is 
rejection of reality. So men and women are different on height. They're different on muscle mass. They're different on where fat is deposited on our bodies, right? Our brains are also different. So there's some binaries. Oh, wow. Security! This is, this is what happens. Oh, did they shut off the volume? Can you hear? Can, can everybody hear? should not listen to fascism. It should not be tolerated in civil society. Nazis are not welcome in civil society. Fuck the police! Govern the people! Thank you. All right, well, we're going to raise our voices. The conversation's going to go on. Let, let, let me be crystal clear. Let, let me be crystal clear. People do not have the right to tell you what you can and cannot listen to. People do not have the right, fringe elements of society do not have the right to hold you hostage to discourse. This is a university. If we cannot have this conversation here, we can't have it anywhere. We have to be able to talk about it. No issues will solve themselves. That sort of behavior is unacceptable in civilized societies. And if that person is a student, <laughs> they, they should be given a warning. And if they do it again, they should be expelled from the university. So this is off now. Okay, okay. so we're going to raise our voices. The event's going to go on. Okay, okay Heather. Yeah. So, gametes, this mic is just going to a camera. Um, the mics are gone. Gametes are binary. Gametes are sperm and egg, right? There's just two types. Chromosomes are also binary. There are X chromosomes and Y chromosomes at that 23rd location for humans, right? Everything else about sex isn't exactly binary because it's complex, because there are a lot of variables going into what makes a male and what makes a female. Anatomically, physiologically, neurologically, behaviorally, male and female aren't a binary, but they are strongly bimodal, right? We are different on average on several variables. And can you define bimodal for us? So, as James so aptly points out in his memo, people don't understand that populations actually have variation, right? When we say that men and women are different, we are not saying men are like this, all men are like this, and all women are like this. What we're actually saying is that populations have variation, and everyone is familiar with the bell curve, right? The bell curve exists for traits like height, in American women, just as it does for height in Doug Furs in Portland, right? It's not normative, it's just a truth. And there being variation between two populations does not suggest that there aren't, that there aren't women who are extraordinarily good at math and science and technology and engineering and there aren't women who are extraordinarily interested in math and engineering and technology and science. So, but there are differences population-wide and cross-culturally in interests. So men and women on average have the same intelligence from what we can tell, but we have different interests. And across cultures, men tend to be more interested in things, and women tend to be more interested in people, exactly as James said in his memo. And so what you find is women actually increasingly overrepresented among the life sciences and underrepresented in the sciences that deal with non-organic things like chemistry, like physics, like math, like engineering. So, so uh, I, I, I could be wrong about this, but James and, and uh, I, the sex ratio is four to one. Can everybody hear me? 
Yeah, thanks. The sex ratio is four to one at Google, and I think that's, oh, testing, testing. It's working. A sex, the, the, sex ra the sex ratio is a four to one at Google among software engineers, and, it is, and, and in the field in general, and Heather or James, is that evidence of discrimination? What is that evidence of? It's evidence of something. I mean, it can't be arbitrary. Yeah, I mean, it's likely a mix of maybe discrimination and also just men and women tending to have different interests in what careers they want to pursue. So I would add to that, come on. Um, I would add to that, we've got a four to one ratio of men to women among software engineers at Google and across the tech sector. And that's been pretty consistent throughout time. You look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you find that. The comparison population in, in statistics, what we would call the expected value, is not the sex ratio of people in the population, right? Because your average person isn't qualified to be a software engineer, right? So what should we look at for your expected value? We've got the observed value, four to one sex ratio of software engineers at Google and across the tech sector, and that doesn't sound right. That sounds way off the one to one that we know the human population to be at. But maybe we should look at the number of people, the ratio of people who are actually prepared for the job, the ratio of people who are likely to be applying for the job in the first place. And for me, the best proxy is people earning degrees in computer sciences. So if we look at their, their educational data for higher ed from the early 70s through last year, people earning bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs in computer sciences, you have it climbing, the sex ratio um, starts, women start around 11% or so, climbing up to around 35% in the mid 80s, and then slowly declining again to their current level of women being, women, deg female degrees in computer sciences at about 20%, which means at the very least, Google is hiring software engineers at exactly the same ratio that universities are producing software engineers, which tells you that there's no discrimination at Google with regard to the sex ratio of software engineers that are being hired. So where does this gross mischaracterization of the memo come from? Where, where do these confusions come from? The, the, I know it's a tough question. <laughs> it's an odd one. It's odd to think about why the and, and I'm really happy that people, how much you want to make a bet that people who freaked out uh, didn't read the memo? Yeah, and how much you want to make a bet that they weren't given the correct tools, the moral infrastructure to make an interpretation and analysis of that? And whose fault is that? That's the educational system's fault, and that's what we have to fix. You show me one problem that, that has been solved by people not talking to themselves. You show me one one instance of someone who's changed a repugnant belief who's been punched in the head. That's not how people change their beliefs. So I, I'm, I'm curious that, that the university put on three counter events, which I think is great. I think it's, they're absolutely in the right. That's exactly what they should be doing. So I could be wrong about this. The, the, the main confusion I see is the inability to understand the difference between stereotyping and talking about population distributions. So could you, I mean, is that off? Could you define stereotype or population distribution? I mean, is that, talk, am I, is my view untethered to reality? Can me take it? Sure. Um, so population distribution is, is what we were just talking about. Uh, a bell curve is a typical population distribution for most complex traits, right? Where you have uh, the, the trait on the x-axis and the frequency of it on the y such that um, there is a mean, an arithmetic average, which is the same as the median, the middle point in the population, which is the same as the mode, the most frequent uh, value. Uh, and so for height, say, you have most people at the average, and those numbers scale, you know, peter off at the edges. You will see this for intelligence, right? Uh, for intelligence, you have a mean defined um, by IQ at 100, and it goes off to the sides. So that is true. Populations have, have variation. And a stereotype is typically a single 
observa an observation uh, that is based on too little data uh, about a population which is generally not responsive to new information. And that's not to say that all stereotypes are wrong. It's also what I missed that. It's not to say that all stereotypes are wrong, uh, but that if your stereotype cannot be updated, then you are not acting in either a rational or a compassionate way. So, and I just want to synthesize this to make sure I'm understanding it. So, the reason for the, there being disparities in certain fields isn't necessarily discrimination, it's that certain people, and I realize the wording is very tricky here, um, certain people gravitate toward certain, th certain professions, for example, and those professions, t like teacher, lawyer, th those are dependent upon the content of those professions. Is that accurate? There's, there's cross-cultural evidence of uh, women's interests being on average different from men's interests. There's no evidence that mean intelligence is different between men and women, although there is evidence that men have higher variability which means we're gonna find more really smart men and more really stupid men than we are gonna find really smart women and really stupid women. Not to say that we haven't all met some really smart women and really stupid women, right? <laughs> but that there are gonna be higher numbers, higher variability, <clears throat> but the same mean with regard to intelligence, but with regard to interests, the means are different, right? And this, this is exactly what you write, right? The, the interests themselves are different. Yeah, I, I think when we're talking about stereotypes, because it's defined so vaguely, we have to understand that the fear is that, I mean, with, within the current understanding of how, how discourses affect society, it is by repeating stereotypes, you actually bring these things into existence. If the fear was if James said, fewer women are interested in tech, this would result in women thinking, well, I shouldn't really be interested in tech. Now, not only does that underestimate women, seriously, it also, the, the under, a proper understanding of distributions of traits actually acts against stereotypes. If you understand that there, is, there, is, there are slight differences which on a broad societal scale will be quite noticeable, you will also notice that there are women in tech, that there are male nurses. Having a realistic look at the situation as it is, is probably the best counter action against negative stereotypes. Right, and we're not seeing anyone argue that there should be more female iron smelters, right? No one is arguing for a correction of the sex ratio in fields uh, that aren't deemed lofty. And you know, the scientist in me wants to say the truth will set you free. We cannot change what may be true at a societal level unless we understand why things are true. Why, why would we want to force someone to do something they don't want to do anyway? I mean, what, I mean I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. It, it's, it maintains sexism, really, because if we are assuming that the choices that men make are the ultimate, absolute best choices, we are making men the default humans. The only reason women aren't doing exactly what men are doing in exactly the same way is because they're doing something wrong or they're being conditioned into not thinking the right way, because really they should be just like men. But in fact, the areas that women dominate, healthcare, education, psychology, publishing, these are all hugely influential areas on society. They are important. So, so I want to I want to bring it back to. So I want to bring it back to diversity. I want to bring it back to inclusion. I, I want to make it clear, and it was pretty me clear to me, I've read the memo repeatedly, but it was, and I read your piece in Quillette, in which you were very explicit about that. You're advocating for, I don't want to put words in your mouth, this is my understanding, you're advocating for equality of opportunity. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, you're not advocating, all of us are advocating for equality of opportunity. As John Rawls says, public education of the first rate. Top schools for everybody, regardless of sex or gender or religion or ethnic origin or immigration status. My own personal belief is, is healthcare falls within, under that umbrella, but t tell me a little bit about, I wanna shift the conversation a little bit about to 
What is equality of opportunity and how does that relate to diversity? Yeah, it's, so it's giving everyone a fair shot at uh, achieving, for example, becoming a software engineer and it's not enforcing equal outcomes on groups and really reducing people to their group membership and saying, because you're in this group, you have maybe collective blame for everyone else in this group. And indeed, as we were talking about before, in those countries where equality of opportunity has been most democratized, roughly speaking Scandinavia, you have, uh, you have people choosing more and more traditional gender roles for their careers as the democratization uh, goes forward. Uh, that there is actually a greater gender split in these, in, for instance, tech fields and healthcare in Scandinavia since there's been greater equality of opportunity, suggesting that when left to their own devices, people will choose what they are most interested in, and it should come as no surprise to anyone that those aren't going to be the same on average for men and for women. Yeah, if you looked at equality of outcome, as my friend Matt Thornton would say to me, you'd have to send the worst singers to the best singing schools, right? I mean, there's something inherently alienating us from our own interests when an arbitrary quota is, it, then when we push people in a certain direction that those individuals don't, don't want to go. But the key is that everybody ought to have an equal opportunity to excel in this country. I mean, that's what makes America, that what, what ought to make America great. I, I don't want to inject my own political opinion necessarily. I don't see that happening in this uh, economic uh, environment under Trump. I think it's, it's become a stain on the United States that we've the most, the people who are disadvantaged don't have those equal opportunities. And when I read the memo and I read your follow-up pieces, you are arguing against that. You are arguing that everybody should have an, an opportunity to excel in this country. Right. And you know, going back to quotas, when you do put those quotas, like a gender quota, you actually, both men and women are less likely to apply because it feels, you know, you, no one wants to be the token uh, member of the group, and then the other group also doesn't because it doesn't feel fair. Huh. All right, now for the controversial part of the conversation. So I, I want to talk about, I want to talk, I want to drill down, I'll push back on Helen's definition of diversity a little, a little bit. Um, so diversity, and I, I, we're on the same page about that definition, basically it's having a composition that is in some ways varied. Usually it means across identity lines, some identity concern. So we can talk about being superficially diverse in terms of skin color, for example. But what's super interesting to me is that the word diversity, as it's become institutionalized in our academic, in our, in our academies, means exhibiting near perfect ideological conformity. <laughs> exhibiting near perfect, thank you, ideological conformity. That's why Uncle Tom's and house Muslims aren't viewed as diverse. A disabled black lesbian who says the wrong things about diversity is not seen as diverse. She's seen as having sold out. James Lindsay and I have talked about this. You kicked out of a group if you don't share their concepts. And that's why when you go to the rallies, the counter rallies, there's nobody arguing against the position, the monolithic position of diversity. There's no counter voices. It's all an identical narrative. Diversity is people are reduced to immutable properties and characteristics like skin color, which in my opinion is incredibly demeaning. And I think we need to conceptualize or, or at least understand, and that's why when James and I invited the Women's Studies Department initially, well, they don't view them, in my, my opinion, they don't view themselves as people interested in dialogue. They think they have found the truth. There's no need to seek it. They're activists. But your epistemology has to come before your activism. Why you're do, doing activism matters. So back to the diversity, do you think there's any merit in what I just said? Uh, do, do you think that diversity has come to mean n exhibiting near perfect ideological conformity? Uh, yeah, I think that those two go hand in hand often, and I saw that at Google where, I mean, the title of the document was Google's Ideological Echo Chamber. Exactly. 
where they kept a strict hold on everyone had to keep the same ideas and anyone that uh, steers away is seen as sort of an apostate from this religion and you, know, you have to punish the apostate to keep everyone together. The irony may be that it's actually harder to quantify ideological diversity and thought diversity and the kinds of diversity that are being lauded are countable. So it's this sort of false numeracy around you can count up what kinds of diversity you've got and what goes on between your ears and your brain isn't necessarily countable, so we're not going to count it. Yeah, I mean, it would be easy for them to just have a survey of maybe political orientations, but I think that would show something that they don't want to see, that they're not very diverse on that measure at all. Yeah, because they don't define diversity as, diver like Jonathan Haidt talks about, diversity of thought. They define diversity as in terms of an exogenous, superficial characteristic, which is really rather demeaning to somebody, I would think. But we can talk about that in the, in the Q&A. I, I want to talk about another thing, the, the word that I asked Helen to define, because this, the, the diversity, the title of the talk tonight, let's talk about diversity, it's almost impossible to have a discussion about diversity unless we have a discussion about inclusion. And I, I want to talk about the Trojan horse term conf inclusion and how it's inextricably wedded to diversity. And please feel free to push back if you, if you think that I'm, I'm way out of line here. So inclusion, it, it's funny how these, they don't invent you know, neologisms, like they don't invent new words. They take a morally salient term and they import and smuggle new meanings in to it, like diversity, like inclusion. So inclusion sounds good. Well, of course we want to include people. Who doesn't want to include people of different race or different gender or different physical ability? I'm deaf in one area. Yeah, we need to be, you know, who doesn't want to include, who wouldn't want that? But the problem, the problem as I see it, and I'm curious if you saw this as training, and, and Helen, I'm particularly curious from you, in practice, Inclusion always means prohibited speech. Inclusion always means prohibited speech. Um, and that's because they've set up a circumstance where oppressed groups have to feel safe in these spaces. And the best way to feel safe is to sanitize them of anything that they could become offended by, or I could be, or someone could become offended by. So inclusion, the word inclusion is just a way to smuggle in res speech restrictions. Did you, did you give, tell me, am I off base? Am I? Yes, you're off base. Okay, good. Well, then ask me in the Q&A. It doesn't make any sense. I, I, well, then great. Then you can come up in the Q&A and ask me. Good, good. Extra credit, extra credit. Go ahead. Um, I, I think, yeah, with inclusion at the moment, then there is a considerable amount of of exclusion because with the conversation that we've just been having, for women to feel included, apparently we all have to believe that gender differences don't exist. I am not a woman who uh, denies biology and therefore my view is excluded. The view of a black conservative is very unlikely to be welcomed and the view of a trans activist who supports freedom of speech for people with very different ideas of gender, even if she thinks they're wrong, is not included. These people are excluded and we have the minorities within minorities. Right. The most sort of, probably the most beleaguered group of all of those are the ex-Muslims or the, um, the reformist Muslims who are trying to criticise the worst aspects of their own religion, getting abuse from far-right racists, getting abuse from believing Muslims, and getting attacked from um, intersectionals because they are not fitting within the category of the, the, the tiny little box that we'd like to put Muslims into. This is not inclusion in any meaningful sense of the word. Yeah, and I think it's also important to note that a lot of these speech codes you know, they make these arbitrary definitions of civil and inappropriate language, and that's really just defined by whoever's in power. And so it, it really does repress a lot of the minority viewpoints, like uh, political minorities. Yeah, and the key point there is viewpoint diversity. And I think you, that's what happened to you 
when the umbrella of diversity and inclusion was waived, well, it wasn't big enough to include a view that took issue with itself, right? And so I think that came up with you. Okay, a few things. So is there anything else that you think is important or a term or an idea or a concept you'd like to get across or a piece in the memo or uh, so something relating to, to, to Google or diversity more broadly? Anybody? I think Anybody up here? we really can't solve the problems that we find in society if we're not able to have these conversations and if we're not able to pursue the truth. And you know, if you see in the memo that I have multiple solutions to increasing uh, women's representation in tech using what we know from psychology. And if, we're, if we just have to deny that and just say, no, that's all sexist, that's, no, you, you can't say that, then we can't actually solve these problems. And it'll just make it actually worse by you know, stigmatizing uh, anyone that we hire and just saying these falsehoods that, no, you're all sexist and this is, you're all pushing women away. Nazis. When, yeah, when really many people are just very welcoming of everyone. And it just didn't, there was a huge disconnect. I would add um, that you referred to discriminatory hiring practices. And I, I would hope that we could all agree that discrimination in any form is abhorrent. That we should be hiring, encouraging people, whatever it is that the job that we're doing in society is, from the broadest swath of the human populace that's interested. Therefore, we should expect that, for instance, corporate boards from the 50s when women were being discouraged and presumably people of color were being discouraged, were not as strong and powerful as they might have been simply because uh, there were people who were being excluded on the basis of the demographics. And if we now move into a situation where we are discouraging people on the basis of demographics, we will once again be selecting out some of the excellence in the population. We should expect excellence in every single demographic, no matter how you slice it. And so we should be looking for excellence everywhere without barrier. And we should be providing people with opportunities so that they can achieve that excellence. I mean, I, I, don't, I honestly, for life of me, do not understand why that is so controversial. I mean, I, I, I really, I'm, something must be lost to me. I also don't understand what is so complicated about not criticizing someone on the basis of an immutable characteristic, but criticizing an idea. I, I, for the life of me, if someone can come up from the Q&A and say why, why it is unacceptable to criticize an idea, I will buy you not one beer, but 10 after that. Uh, criticize, criticizing a person on the basis of an immutable characteristic is off the table. We need to provide everybody with equal opportunities. We need to do the best job that we can do to be fair, to create systems of fairness that allow people to flourish and thrive. Uh, we, need to take, we need to have conversations. We need to have hard conversations. We don't need to act like screeching, spoiled children, but we need to ask people tough questions in the Q&A when we have these. So I welcome those questions. That's what we do in civilized society. That's how we behave. So f finally, a few things before we do the Q&A. Uh, so you, you, looking at the responses to this memo and how people have mischaracterized it and what they have done to you is horrible and I'm incredibly sorry that you've gone through that. Have you, do you regret it? I mean, it's definitely a complicated situation. I, and there's maybe some things that I would do differently in hindsight, but I really think that the conversation had to be had, and uh, I, I really can't regret trying to help things. And even though now it seems that people are even less willing to talk about these issues at Google and many other tech companies, I'm hoping that things will swing around and that it'll ultimately improve things. Yeah, so what would you have done different? And, and do, do you think you were wrong about anything in that? Like if you were to look back and say, oh, maybe I should have written this this way or taken that out or? I, I could have, of course, you know, written more about it. It was already 10 pages though. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the people who don't like it aren't gonna read it anyway. Yeah, you, 
I mean, they just take out individual sentences. And of course, I, I use some language that you know, was in the psychology literature that wasn't really um, commonplace. If this was really written for engineers. I wasn't expecting it to be leaked. So if I had knew, known that, then I would have written it differently. So this would have been more worth it to you if the changes, if the recommendations to change the culture to allow flourishing, that would have made this more worth it to you? Because you've suffered a hit in income, grief, people saying absolutely, totally mischaracterizing the memo. Right. Yeah, it seems like you know, a lot of it was just trying to help our culture at Google. And, uh, but if you look at the surveys now, it seems like about 80% of conservatives uh, feel like they can't speak at all now, which is really disappointing because you know, the psychological safety, which is something that I cite in the document, is just being able to bring your whole self to work and feeling like you can speak up without being harshly judged. And that was you know, one of the main measures that they saw actually improve team performance. But that's precisely what we don't have now, which is really unfortunate. I, so I lied, my final, final question. So I have to admit some trepidation about this conversation. It had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with my fear of Google. And I was really, really thinking about that. Like they could really, really do a number on me if they wanted to. Was that running through your head at all? Like, this is Google. Like, whoa, it's like, this is actually, some God doesn't exist, Google does. This is like, <laughs> God. So were, was, that, was that a, uh, was that, Helen, were you, th were you, was that a concern? Were you, oh, Google, pff. I mean, what was it? So I think I'm now getting a little more paranoid. I mean, they are <laughs> <laughs> the most powerful company they have the most or some of the most uh, lobbyists in the country so they're much more powerful than they make themselves out to be and so yes yeah, so I, I am now getting paranoid <laughs> heather were you paranoid at all google just even having this conversation not yet not yet <laughs> i actually for real i thought about deleting my google account for real, I thought about, I mean, how do you fight Google? That's what do you, that's not even David and Goliath. It's just, I don't even know what it, I can't even think, it's so huge. I can't even think of it. It's the whole universe and just a pebble. Uh, were you concerned about Google? Uh, I wasn't, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're a great company, great company. All right, uh, so we're, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna open it up to Q&A, but before we do that, thank you. So, so, so here's how we'll run the Q&A. Uh, we, we, we obviously can't force anybody to come up, but we would appreciate the, the people who disagree with what we've had to say, if they could come up first, please. And if you're agreeing, you just want to support us, that's, that's great. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind waiting until everybody who disagrees could, they probably, probably half of them probably gone, but we're looking for the tough questions and we're looking for a sincere, honest conversation. So, uh, also, one more thing, if you could please just state your questions. We'd like to do as many questions as we possibly could. So uh, don't pontificate, uh, no stories, no proselytization, just uh, what's your question and then we'll field those. So thanks. So Andy will hold the mic and if you want to line people, line up, line up, line up and we'll, we'll try to get as many as we can. We'll do the best job as we can. Disagreements first, please. Oh, and if you could say your name, just, you know, Susie or Fred or whatever, that would be great. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, nice and loud for us. A hundred years ago, there was data that showed that blacks had lower lung capacity than whites. And this was used to rationalize why there weren't as many African-American athletes at the time. How can we be sure we're not doing that again? Like, we have this data. It seems like good data. That seemed like good data then. How can we be sure that we're not attributing these factors that could be cultural reasons why there are fewer women to biological reasons? That is a... Yeah. 
Uh, I, that's definitely a very important consideration. And you know, I'm never saying that we should discriminate against women, discourage them from uh, going into tech. Anyone that's interested in tech should go into it. Uh, and you know, there is definitely you know, issues of discrimination still happening in many sectors. Uh, but I mean, I think it's important to at least look into this. And because you can use this as a solution, you know, these are the, some psychological differences on average. Uh, and men and women tend to approach the workplace differently. So maybe if we change the workplace, then we could actually solve the problem. I, I would add, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that in countries like the Scandinavian countries where there is um, greater equality of opportunity, girls, um, in fact, everywhere where it's looked at, girls and boys are equivalent in intelligence, but there's greater variation between boys and girls. And uh, in places where girls and boys are more allowed to choose what they do, we find that girls and boys are roughly equivalent with regard to math and science ability, but that girls actually seem to outrank boys with regard to reading. And so what seems to be driving choice is relative intelligence with an individual. So on average, girls in Scandinavia are super strong in math and science, just as strong as boys are, but they're better in the language arts. And so they're ending up choosing to go into those fields, like Helen talked about, healthcare and education and publishing and such. Because within themselves, even though they're good in some of the quantitative, logical, you know, more, you know, scientifically rigorous fields, they are even more good at other things, and so they're choosing to do the things that they are better at. Whereas boys tend to be just as good in science and math, but not as good in some linguistic things. And so they choose um, to go into the science and math because they are relatively better within individuals. And, um, and I just, yeah, one other thing is that I would say that the psychological differences hold up cross-culturally and cross-methods. So that's one thing that suggests that it's not an artifact of bad data. Um, wonder, it's not to say I, that it's impossible, but it suggests that it's just a wonderful question because it just cuts right to the heart of what could be a, a problem in our thinking. So thank you so much for that. Really a great question. Hi there. Uh, this might be directed more towards uh, Professor Hang since you brought up this idea of... What's cultural... your name? Sorry, my name's Dave. Dave. Uh, and brought up this idea of cultural evolution. Um, so culture like biology is evolutionary, and a, a principle of evolution is the, select, the selection of, of advantageous traits under varying conditions and environmental forces. But when you apply that framework to our culture and society, um, you sort of neglect to address how the predominant environmental forces, the adaptive pressure that's influencing the selection of certain valuable traits in our, our roles in our culture, are the interests of a capitalist, white, male, patriarchal ideology that has defined gender and race roles for generations in our society. Um, I'm curious to know why we're so dismissive of the power and influence that this force has had in generating the gender and racial differences or stereotype, stereotypes that you're defending as natural. What's the question? What's the question? That's my question. So That was a long question. No, no, but we're really... I'm not, I'm, wait, 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 hold on, I'm not ignoring anything, I'm just trying to understand the question. I, I, there's, a lot, there's a lot of work. Can you s shrink okay. it down? My to, question is, why are we, sorry, I'm going to grab, why are we prior prioritizing representation of certain, or rather, prioritizing representation of certain genders and races may be unnatural in the context of our society, but our society has been unnaturally shaped by the influences of a single ideological framework. And I, okay. I don't understand why? Okay, now that question I understand, so I'm not mm -hmm. trying to intentionally misunderstand mm -hmm. someone. I, I want to understand so one, but, but I want to say, but this, is, but, but, but this is important because this is what we do in a dialogue. If you ask a question and I don't understand, I say, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question, and the response ought not to be, well, fuck you, right? <laughs> well, that's, that's, I'm, 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 I'm trying to understand the question, so thank you for rephrasing the question. So, I, I'm still not positive that I understood the question. Um, uh, you want to rephrase you, it for me? Can, can, you, can, can you do it one more time? So, may, you, may, may I try one more first time. to okay. see if I heard you? All right, don't interrupt. You seem to be defending that there are certain gender roles or traits. Hold on. Hey, guys. Hold on. Hey, guys, we're trying to... 
one at a time. Honestly, okay? I'm just truly telling you, we're trying to understand. We have no agenda to silence anybody. That's why he's standing up here for three minutes. Please, I'm not trying to be intentionally obtuse. I'm trying to understand. Sure. You seem to be accepting that there are certain truths about the natural evolution of traits and gender roles and race roles in our society. My point is that those have all been shaped for generations by a predominant ideology that seems to prioritize the interests of a certain ideological framework. And I find that to be unacceptable personally. And so I think prioritizing underrepresented uh, peoples or opinions might be unnatural in our framework, but I don't see that as problematic. And I would like to understand why you potentially okay. see that as problematic. Um, I think there are we could probably talk about this for days, and I think that we would come to agreement ultimately, uh, because uh, reasonable people tend to. I think there's an error in your assessment of what I and we are saying, and it comes down to what's called the naturalistic fallacy, which is the conflation of description of what is with what ought to be. And so in evolutionary biology, we're trying to describe what is true so as to better make frameworks, make policies to shape society to the betterment of all. And so by describing what is, and again, I find the strongest evidence for what people actually are when they're cross-cultural studies, they're also cross-time, so that they aren't particularly within a given ideology or political system, um, that when you can point to cross-cultural evidence that says men and women are different, uh, then you can say, okay, are these things that we've inherited from 100 million years of being bisexual species in which male and female are different, uh, how much of that is actually outmoded at this point? Can we change some of it? Can we change some gender norms? I'm thinking we can, uh, but we can't change some things and pretending that what's true isn't is going to stall the conversation and progress rather than help us move forward. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that I fully answered your question. But. Did you want to jump in? To... No. That was good. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for rephrasing the question. We appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Hi. So. What's your, what's your name? Um, I'd rather not say my name because I know the tendency for people in this room to dox people. So. It's. The Quite frankly, so, it's not that what, hard to find out my name. What if is that? You really the tendency of the tendency of the people in the room for to people to dox people. It's happened to plenty okay. of my friends, okay, and specifically by people in this that. room, no like doxing. people behind me. But hey, um, so what's so, your question? Which well, I'll call. Yeah, we're getting into that. All right, so uh, up with me are a couple of my comrades. We have done. Yes, yes, you So what's your, what's your question? Yes, I'm getting into that okay. right now, if you'd let me finish. All righty, so I want to talk a little bit about diversity of thought. So you brought up how you think there should be a diversity of ideas, and that you think that academia is shutting down ideas. And all three of us have seen that too, but we're wondering why you're not talking about that. In our time at PSU, we have tried to do protests, we have tried to talk to the Board of Trustees, and you know what happens? We get shut down. We get shut down by cops, cops who are threatening us. We are not allowed to table in the park blocks just because South will not let us to. And our ideas are constantly being shut down, and yet you think you're the ones whose ideas are not being heard, where we're trying to do everything in our power to get our ideas out there. And Your so ideas should not be shut that. down. Your ideas should not be shut down, and whoever it is who's shutting you down, I will pers I, look, I'm happy if you want, you don't tell me your name, I'll come after it. We will walk into my dean's office personally, and I'll make sure you guys get a table. How's that? Your ideas should not be shut down. And I'm sorry that's happened to you, and that's, that's wrong. Actually, I am. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to draw any problem here, but what, what I sort of problematize is, is um, like if you're talking about you want to make sure somebody has the capacity to free, have free speech, right? But you literally just interrupted her in the middle of speaking. Yeah, because so I mean, she like, wasn't asking her question. Know, but you're, no, what I'm saying is, like, yeah, what, I, what I'm trying so to say is, So what's your question? Like, my, I don't really have a question. I'm just trying to... Okay, well, only know. questions. That's why I said in the beginning, we only take questions. <laughs> we only take questions. Next. 
<laughs> well, it's, if you have a question, ask it. If you have a question, ask it. What's your question? All right, next up. Ask your question. We'll get as many questions. Uh, that's not a question. Maybe we need to talk about what a question is. All right, next one. Next, what's your question, sir? All righty. Um, my question is, um, considering your time at Google, do you believe that they're going to be using predictive algorithms in their hiring practices? Boy. Predictive algorithms in the hiring practice? Yeah, like neural networks. Um, <laughs> they, they definitely analyze the hiring data. They don't use it right now. It's mostly just people looking at the data in the hiring decision at the moment. Yeah. But in the future, sure. Just real quick, what are you, what are you talking about? Just one sentence, one sentence. Yeah, predictive algorithms basically predict things. They can say, based off of your behavior, based of uh, your communication patterns, they could say, He's right wing, he's left wing. Okay, and your answer to that is what? At least in the hiring committee, I don't think they do that. Uh, resume screening, they might do that, like recruiting, or especially in the future. Uh, my name is Robert Eller. I'm a, a senior adult learner here. I have two hopefully quick questions, if I may be allowed. Uh, James, um, I read your, your piece, and I also read some other things um, a number of the scientists whose work you cited um, stated that your conclusions based on their work, as you cited it, were incorrect. Were you aware of that? And Can you so, name those scientists, sir? I, I don't have the names, but I'm just, I'm just saying they were, you know, I mean, from what I read. So, uh, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. There's one uh, scientist who uh, the uh, neuroticism work that I cited and he basically agreed with me. He, he wrote in quite a long piece, and then uh, Wired and many other uh, publications quoted one section where he said, uh, yeah, pr basically don't stereotype people and don't apply this to an individual, which is exactly what I was saying. He agreed that, yes, there is a difference in averages, but just don't stereotype people. So he was actually agreeing with a lot of what I was saying. You, yeah, sure, sure. You're, you're um, I'm sorry, I, f I forgot your name. Heather. Uh, okay. The, um, what you said about in the Scandinavian countries, the you know, men and women diversifying when they had, when they had more choice, and, you know, and there was more edu educational equality, which they have. What I'm also wondering, did you, did you note whether, whether incomes for those, or you know, in other words, economic rewards, for those various things might be more equal, hmm. and so that the economic incentive for people choosing might be might be taken away. Whereas in our country, we have you know we have you know so you know yeah. software engineers making X and teachers making you know something like this. Yeah, and that that's one thing that pushes men into tech, for example, because men have the expectation to earn more, and so uh, that that is partly what's uh, causing the gender gap in tech. It's a, it's a fabulous question, and I don't know the answer in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, I don't think, so the question specifically is, in, say, Sweden, are nurses and teachers paid more such that women can make those choices uh, without taking the financial hit that they do in the U.S.? And I don't know the answer to that. I, I believe it's more equal, and there's just a better welfare system so that even if they lose their job, they're not, you know, out of luck. All right, thank you for the question. Hi, my name is Micah. Um, I'm a male ballet dancer by profession, and uh, I'm looking to start professing uh, in my expertise. And uh, as I fill out these long applications that take forever, uh, I get to the end, and then you're started to ask uh, what your race and gender, and you usually need to give a long uh, uh, formal paper on how you would be diverse and what you would bring to that. Uh, I'm now wondering if I should uh, stop saying that I'm a white male. Is is it? Am I being paranoid now? Should I st now start to uh, check off the little thing that says I don't want to answer? Is it that kind of time to do that now? I What's couldn't possibly advise you on that. 
I mean, <laughs> I know that. Did you, anybody have a response? I mean, pff, I don't I, think you're being paranoid. <laughs> paranoid? <laughs> don't think or do I don't think you're being paranoid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not in a position to tell you how to identify what to do. I'm, yeah, but that's, yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks for your question. Hey, uh, I'm Hi. Caitlin. What's your um, name? Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. Thanks so, for coming. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, I, what I was wondering is um, specifically your guys' thoughts on um, why, if we're assuming that um, all of the conclusions that you laid out about the innate biology and um, psychology of men and women are correct, the way you say they are, um, why then the natural interests of the average men um, in the U.S. and the jobs they gravitate to are those that are consistently more respected and better paying um, than those of the average woman? I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're more respected in any way. I mean, teachers and nurses and uh, doctors in general, aren't, are, those are well-respected professions. It, it's more that uh, the professions that men tend to gravitate towards tend to pay more, and, but that doesn't necessarily mean respected. And there's a lot of like dirty jobs, basically like garage or uh, garbage men, and that that's not a well-respected job. But that's you know, ninety-nine percent men. So you could speak to the um, income gap then. Uh, well, yeah. So there, there's many factors. I mean, part of it is you know maybe uh, well, men and women tend to gravitate towards different careers. Men tend to work longer hours. Men tend to negotiate more. So that's that's something that a job can change where if they say that negotiation, the salary is negotiable, then that will actually allow more women to negotiate. Uh, that, that, so that would be one thing that would uh, reduce the gender gap. Uh, like th there are many different factors. So I'm gonna push back a little bit and say, I think that there are many male professions such as you list, or I think you listed, but um, in, in, you know, engineers and, and doctors and lawyers that were traditionally um, quite male, some of which aren't anymore, um, but which are more respected. Uh, and their greater remuneration uh, probably is directly related to the fact that traditionally, historically, uh, they were more done by men. That in, you know, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, there weren't a lot of men being school teachers and nurses and women weren't seen as being as needing to bring in an actual salary, right? It, what it was that the, those those pay grades were about sexism for sure. But the, the other side of that is, you know, just as we were talking about greater male variability with intelligence, I would say there are a lot of jobs that are traditionally male that are more highly respected, but there are also many, as as you mentioned, that are much less respected. And so you have a lot of male um, male jobs traditionally male jobs that still have an incredibly skewed sex ratio, uh, that don't pay well, and that we're not hearing any uproar about getting more women into those jobs. Um, and that we don't assume that there aren't women doing garbage collection or, um, or uh, doing iron smelting um, because of sexism. We assume, we, don't, we just don't talk about it. And so we really need to be talking about that thing too if we're ascribing differences now um, to you know, sex ratios and as engineers to sexism, then what about the, sex, the skewed sex ratio among iron smelters? Isn't that sexism too? Helen, did you want to jump in or no? Oh, I was just going to mention there's a, a wonderful um, look at this in, in um, Quillette that I, I will try and find and, and post somewhere where somebody has really broken down the different choices that um, men and women often make when they're looking at jobs, that men are far more likely to look at raw pay, while women um, balance a whole load of different factors of time, hours, travel, benefits. And they, to be honest, they make a more rounded decision. They then report greater satisfaction. And I, I think women do it better, to be honest. <laughs> All right, that was a great question. Thank you, really good. Hello, my name's Chris, and Hi, my Chris. question is directed first for Helen. Um, I'm a big fan of some of your writings on postmodernism and its various offshoots, uh, things like intersectionality, the various theories, and so forth. Uh, I'm wondering if you feel that these sorts of theories have influenced the management of Google, for instance, in uh, making their policy decisions and 
the, the decision to fire Mr. Damore. Also, if, if you do think so, what sort of mechanisms have there been there? And what do you think the future holds? Yeah, I, I absolutely do think that they have, as these ideas have gone into mainstream society, they've, they've traded on the good name of second wave liberal feminism, of the civil rights movement, of gay pride, then there is a real pressure for companies, particularly big companies, to be seen to approach things in the right way. And so they are got, a lot of people, when they've argued with me about this, they've said that you embarrassed Google, had it been kept quiet, nothing like this would have happened. But this is a pressure that's coming in from the outside, which really does demonstrate the extent to which the postmodern ideas, which then went into the next sort of waves of critical theory and entered into mainstream social conscience, is rebounding on on people who are challenging that narrative, who want to bring more into the conversation. And I don't think this is going to stop anytime soon. I think that we're gonna to have to keep talking about this, have to keep pointing this out. I mean, this was, I'm, I'm very sorry it happened to you, but it was just the perfect example of what we've been talking about, that you have to keep to this one narrative now. And, and yes, is it postmodernism? Yes, yes it is. <laughs> It's a great, that was an incredibly profound question. Seriously, it's a wonderful question. Hi, my name is, hi, my name is Nat. Uh, I just have a quick question. How do we get people excited about discussion? Uh, I am a food service worker in Smith and uh, I pass by pro-life uh, posters like every single day and they often get defaced and they get erased and people tear them down and how do we get people to, instead of react that way, direct their fervor towards having a conversation about the things that they disagree with? How do we get people excited? About that? Yeah, we've lost that. We've lost the ability to have those civil conversations and we need to reclaim them. And the university is the epicenter of where we reclaim those conversations. And the most difficult conversations, particularly if they have a moral valence, are the most important conversations to have. Race, gender, you name it. Uh, and although I don't happen to share, and I was totally sincere when those people said that if they want a table out and they have some you know, crazy Marxist view and they want to put pamphlets on a table or, look, no, I've totally, I, look, let, let me be crystal clear. If, I think my atheist pedigree at this point is pretty much impeccable. Uh, if, if the Christians want to come to this university and they're sponsored by a group at the university and someone's running around saying the earth is 5,000 years old or they're biology denialists, that person should be allowed to speak. We shouldn't try to disable the speaker systems. We shouldn't use blowhorns. But I'll tell you what I would do. I would have a counter to that. I would have a debate. I would set something up where we engage in a discussion. And uh, I am sorry if people have put pro posters up and if you're pro-life, well, I don't happen to share that view. It is inexcusable for those posters to be shut down. It's inexcusable for people to not air views. And that is exactly the opposite of what we should be having in the university. And I will be truly your staunchest advocate, although the dean probably hates me at this point, but I, <laughs> I will be your staunchest advocate to make sure that your voice is heard. So thanks. Hi, I have a question for Mr. Damore. If back when you were writing that memo, if you had known everything you do now about how, not just Google, how Google would react, but what the impact would be to you and your family financially, what the impact would be to you and your family as far as physical safety goes, like threats and people wanting to do bad things, and then as far as just general happiness for you and your family. If you had known all that then when you were writing that memo, would you still have done what you did? There were definitely things that would change, words that would change, you know, so that they couldn't just be quoted out. Um, but, you know, I, I still feel like it had to have been said and that there were many people at Google that were, you know, very happy that I did that. So it's, it would be selfish for me to say, no, I wish I never had done that. That's good, thank you. I'm, I'm Tina Russell, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I am amazed Helen puts up with me. 
Um, and I want to ask, so you, Heather, you mentioned that uh, you know, the rate of women at Google is like 20%, and that reflects the um, percentage of women that are graduating with computer science degrees. And I think, um, that's about right, but I, I thought, uh, so that indicates that there isn't you know, cultural discrimination against women. And it got me thinking, um, Brad Glasgow wrote an article recently about um, Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. And, um, and they, because he was, he was accused of sexism or something back in the day. And What's so your question? Atari people, okay. They, they looked into it and they found, um, uh, like, it was, he had about a 36% of, like, uh, women uh, working, 36% of people working at the company were women. And that got, um, and, you know, and those women don't feel, you know, while reporting, they didn't feel forced to work there. They, it was a huge yeah, so what's your, what's your question? What's your and, question? And I'm so wondering, like, what, and, and Atari was an enormously successful and creative company. So I'm like, what is the difference there with between Google now and Atari, like, 30 years ago, that would say, like, because programming was harder back then, and they had more women. And is that, like... What is the like? What is the, the difference there? Because that seemed to go. That would seem to go against the idea that that women um, should that like, you know, only like one in five of us wants to go into uh, tech or whatever. It's, it's actually a really good question, um, and it's something that I've been wrestling with. I'm trying to figure this one out because I've been staring at these statistics now from the Bureau of Labor Statistics from the Bureau of Labor Studies. Um, <laughs> Statistics is right, and then the higher ed statistics. And the higher ed stats on people earning degrees in CS and computer sciences climbs to like 36% in the mid 80s, women. And then it's stable for a little bit and then it declines. So what was that? What was going on in the 70s and the early 80s in computer science uh, that women were getting more and more and more interested for a little while and then it dropped off again? So again, the, uh, the employment at, across the tech sector seems to have mostly paralleled what was going on in the universities, uh, which means either there was, well, it, it, it means at the very least that the tech sector was hiring people at the rate that they were being produced. But what, what was happening in the 70s and 80s that was so enticing to women that isn't happening now? Uh, I think part of the answer is the drop-off really started to happen in the late 90s with the dot-com boom. That's when, that's when you see the numbers start to drop. And um, that could be, and it's not, as, as we were talking about, it's not that fewer women are now going into computer science fields, but more men are. So the ratio starts to change because you get more men going in with dot-com, and dot-com means two things. It's high risk and it's high remuneration when it hits. And both of those things seem to be, on average, associated with things that men tend to be more interested in doing than women. Men are, on average, more interested in throwing it all into something and taking a risk that it's not going to work out at all um, than going into something by which they might be able to explore and do some fun, creative, amazing, important technological work, but where the risk is relatively low. And so it looks like, and this is like, I'm, I'm kind of guessing here, but I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, that women seem to increase in the tech sector under relatively stable times, whereas under growth conditions, when it's the Wild West out there, uh, it looks like there's more men who end up going in. And it's not that there are fewer, that, that women are dropping out, but that the number of men, the absolute number of men increases, so that changes the ratio. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that's a complete answer. I think there's a lot more to that's it. That's a great question. Great question. Hi there, my name's Kyle. Thank you for talking tonight. Uh, for I had a question specifically about empathy as it relates to what you're talking about. So the work that I do is about non-movers in partisanship, the fact that it's one of the few social characteristics that doesn't deviate after people are exposed to different points of view. And I'm wondering, you know, in the room today, there's this sort of, you know, there's a latency of anger and maybe resentment, but also virtuous signaling that people support you. And I'm wondering how you reconcile the fact that there are strong emotional responses to having a different point of view, and that actually affects things at Google. So, for example, mere exposure mm -hmm. therapy, uh, therapy uh, theory is 
happens at Google, where just being surrounded or exposed to people who are different than you causes emotional turbulence. And I wonder whether or not that's been an experience that has mm -hmm. informed the work that you, the memo that you wrote in terms of like conflicting feelings, obviously feeling like you weren't being supported in that institution. Does that question make sense? Yeah, actually, I think it's a great question. Did you, have you read Paul Bloom's new book? I have, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think definitely that, that affects you know, how included you feel at, at work because if everyone is saying things that you know, run counter to your internal morals and uh, everyone feels shame to not say anything about that, then you feel out of place. And there's a lot of also just because people are shamed from that, you feel like no one else thinks that but really, there are other people. They just you know, are shamed into silence. And yeah, I, I don't think I fully answered it, but that's a little bit of. What, how would you answer that question? So for, for, I found it interesting there was a conflation between a call for civility at the beginning of the talk, and then you clearly had an emotional reaction to the protesters that used an established political protest tool, which is disruption, and you refer to them as childish, when in fact they were just engaging in a different form of discourse. And I wonder how you negotiate that conflation. Well, I, well okay, I guess now I understand the question. I didn't understand the question before. Uh, I think that the semantic range of the word discourse has been so expanded as to consider screeching and throwing stuff around the room a discourse. That's not a discourse. <laughs> well, I guess my counter argument that is that anger to the things that you're saying is a legitimate response because it's a part of the human experience sure, to be frustrated. Uh, absolutely, you can, be anger, you can be angry all you want and when you get angry, why don't you go out in the football field which is 35 feet from here and start screaming at the, at the goal post. They're, they're free to do that, but we're trying to have a conversation and we're trying to have a talk and a, a, f a slim minority of people, even a majority of people, don't have the right to impose upon the discourse of other people. And this is actual discourse, the questions that have, have been fantastic. That's how we learn, that's how we engage. Which John Stuart Mill, if he who knows only his own side of the case doesn't even know that. So I'm not buying that that's discourse. I'm, I'm, those people, they should be given a warning and then expelled. That's it, all right, next question. Hold on, let me, let me add something first. Oh, Heather, Heather. Andy, Andy, I'm gonna add something. I would say that empathy um, is about theory of mind, right? Uh, and you know, can you put yourself into the other person's head and understand what they're experiencing? And the theatrical discourse, it's impossible not to know what they're trying to communicate, um, but there's actually no way in, there's a barrier uh, to, to actually feeling anything besides you're angry. I get that you're angry. Um, but whereas, um, you know, I, sitting here in real time, in real space, and being able to make eye contact is the first and most important way to actually make a connection. And that's why I said to one of the earlier questioners, I think if we had a few days, and maybe it wouldn't take that long, uh, we could figure out where we disagree and where we agree and why we do so and um, figure out if there's anything actually fundamental. Um, you know, for, for me, um, there are very few fundamental things that if you believe it and I cannot convince you otherwise, wow, I don't think that we can actually really move forward. You know, if you don't believe that there's an objective reality, I'm not sure we can get very far, right? Um, <laughs> so you sir, you, sir, are wearing a pirate hat, so I want you to know that the we have raised the bar of our expectation. Well, similarly, my question has a pretty silly frame of reference, but I promise it does go somewhere. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, this is kind of for Heather, and I, I guess Brett's not actually there, um, but in, in some way, James, but um, I was wondering what students can do about people I call Vogons, essentially the bureaucrats and the administrators who run the school. In my favorite series of books, the Vogons were bureaucratic aliens who would blow up planets and blame the people on those planets for not filing paperwork to prevent it. At universities, administrators drag students through kangaroo chorts, blaming students for not following the rules, jack up tuition, and even interfere in curriculums. What can students do to hold these administrators accountable? Well, I think given your reference, the answer has to be 42. <laughs> <laughs> no. So. <laughs> um, there is good faith protest and bad faith protest, and we need to reserve space for good faith protest 
no matter what. And when there are bad actors who are using the goodwill of people who are either confused about what they're doing or are just looking for a cause, who are interested in and willing to take down a school, which is what happened and is happening at Evergreen, where Brett and I came from, um, the administration must, should, has to be willing to shut that down. Most protest, until very recently, is honorable. So um, the, the question was, you know, question was kind of like, how do you deal with the tension, the real tension between, let's assume that everyone on both sides now is good faith, between students who see the need for change and admin who sees the need for usually conservatism, right? Um, there needs to be iterative dialogue. And that seems like I'm passing the question, and I kind of am because it's not precise, but um, iterated dialogue in which sit-downs are possible. Good, good question. You earned the pirate hat there. Give yourself a stripe <laughs> or a peg leg or something. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm a CS student here, and I have a question for James. Um, since you've been terminated by Google by left-wing ideologues and have been thrust into this culture war, has this spurred any creativity or inspiration to hack on new projects for you? I have a great question. Or do you not even have time? <laughs> great question. Yeah, I've, I've definitely been tinkering around, and, uh, but I, I do feel most comfortable at a company rather than just you know, by myself uh, coding. So I've been applying to new places, and hopefully I'll find a new job soon. <laughs> Uh, my name is Matt. Uh, good evening, ladies and gents. I'm just here to ask you a layman question, uh, starting with a layman sort of quote. Um, sure. Dan Carlin said the American dialogue, something along the lines of the American dialogue is like going to a book club where everyone's reading different books. Um, and I just kind of wanted to know what do you guys think either the cause is or something individuals can take uh, or a move action uh, individuals can take to, uh, I guess, help simmer down, I guess, that broken tribal nature that's really disrupted both interpersonal communication and um, group communication overall, online and off, uh, offline. Gotta yeah. love you, man. I, 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 think, I love you, that's an awesome question. I think one first step would just be, you know, assume good intentions. So we often just assume, oh yeah, they're evil, they're, they're some ideologue, but really, you know, they have some set of ideas, and the more you discuss with them, you know, if you actually have a discussion, you'll probably agree on most everything if you actually hash it out. And so I think we really just have to have the conversations rather than just on Twitter or something, having these uh, you know, little insults back and forth. It, it won't really solve anything. But even on Twitter, assume good intentions. That's exactly what I was going to say. Start with the assumption that the person on the other side is a human just like you are. Yeah, make sure that you follow people who disagree with you and uh, in as many different ways as you can. Try to find some way in which you agree with somebody who you fundamentally disagree with in other ways. If you can try and expand your circle a bit for the, and recognize the humanity and the common goals of other people, you, the, the tribalism for yourself can, well, you can decrease, you can expand your circle of friends and contacts and you can, um, you can get people from different ide ideologies talking to each other. I've, I have the most wonderful followers on Twitter and I have people who are Republicans, I have people who are, are Marxists and they can have conversations because they're prepared to, under, to accept that the other person is in good faith, that they do share some common goals. Yeah, I'll echo that. So the, there was a, someone here asking questions we didn't understand. I'm deaf in one ear, so I don't ha ha hear half the stuff. So don't assume that I'm like intentionally not trying to understand. I'm, I'm legitimately trying to understand. And, it, and it's very hurtful to me when people don't extend that charitable umbrella and they go from the charitable umbrella immediately to Nazi. You know, no, it's just, when I walk in the bathroom and I see my name spray painted with swastikas all over the walls thinking I'm a Nazi, and when I see racist and white supremacists giving my daughters another race, that's incredibly hurtful to me. So as a minimum, don't do that. 
Now, one tier above that. So here's some specifics that I, I would say. Ask somebody how they know what they know. Very rarely do people have, will people invoke a defensive posture when you ask them how they know what they know. They have defensive postures and arguments for conclusions. An another great trick, I published a piece about this in the Skeptic Magazine in 2017. If there's one thing I've learned from, I don't know, 20 years of researching and seriously thinking about critical thinking, it's, um, this is going to be almost a heresy when I say this here, but it's don't ask somebody for their evidence. It's a total waste of your time. Uh, ask somebody the following questions. Under what conditions could your beliefs be false? I'm not saying I can provide those conditions, but what evidence would you have to see to, to make you revise that belief? Now, if their response to you is, well, there is no evidence, then your response to them is then you don't formulate your beliefs in the basis of evidence because to formulate your beliefs in the basis of evidence by definition means that another piece of evidence would come in and you revise your belief. But as a, as a rudiment to the conversation, focus on how people know what they think they know. All right, we're almost out of time. We I wanna, think- I oh, wanna pick up on that sure, first. Sure, please, um, please. But you've just described uh, hypothesis-driven science as opposed to data-driven science which is what a lot of is passing for science these days. So hypothesis-driven science starts with an idea that you try as hard as you possibly can to falsify. Yep, falsify, that's the key. Falsify. Falsify. And if you cannot do it, the more times you've tried to falsify it and the more times you cannot do it, the more likely it is that it's true, although you haven't proven it true. Uh, but the more likely it is that it's true, the harder that you yourself have tried to falsify it and, and offered it up to your friends and your enemies and seen if they can falsify it. Yep. And I'll add one more kick to that. It's the most important time to do that is in the moral realm. Diversity, anything, those, all those questions to us should be all the feasibility questions. Boom, 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 boom. How could your belief be false? What could be wrong? What evidence could I provide you with to make you rethink diversity? What evidence about inclusion? Boom. If you do that, you create wedges in people's cognitive structures that allow them it's in the Greek, they call it aporia, like a state of wonder. They're like, oh, wow, I never thought of that. It's cool. But you're not feeding them any evidence. You're asking them what evidence they can provide. All right, cool. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, last one. You're the last one, Am my I friend. the lucky last guy? Okay. I have two. Do I have time for both? Yeah. All yep. right. You're lucky. Heather. Lucky. Uh, let's see. Why do you think that the people who are opposed to panels such as this are so afraid of them? What do you think is so, uh, well, I guess I have a follow-up too with it, or an idea. So is it consistent in your opinion with the norepinephrine and epinephrine release of like fight and flight response? Uh, and if so, uh, is it true that this, a panel like this poses an existential threat that warrants a response like that, and then, I, or is that, is that enough to? Well, it's cer certainly enough to riff on for a little while. Um, I, the, the epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, and all of these circuits are going to be mechanistic answers that, that certainly you could point to and probably measure with regard to why people end up feeling good about responding in uh, temporarily aggressive ways and then go home and report on it. Um, but the I, th I think people do feel an existential threat um, at the prospect of discussions of differences between groups, differences between populations, uh, because people are actually afraid that the truth will be ugly, because sometimes the truth is ugly. I personally, from what I've seen with regard to gender, I see no evidence that the truth is ugly, uh, but um, if it was, that wouldn't make it any, for me as a scientist and as someone who thinks that you have to know what's true before you can then try to change society on the basis of knowing what's true, you've got to know it whether it's pretty or ugly. Uh, and so I think that there's fear that the truth will be ugly and therefore if we shout loud enough, no one will be able to hear it. You have one, you had one more, is it a quick one? I have one for James, if it's okay. all right. Last um, one. I come from Seattle, I've been surrounded by far leftist my entire life. I've hardly ever known a conservative person. And I've watched uh, people's lives be affected, affected negatively by joining activist communities, uh, their mental wealth, the relationships with their families, their friends. And it's taken me some growth to get to a point where I'm no longer afraid of the actual individuals who espouse these opinions or have these beliefs, but I'm beginning to see 
the ideology as, uh, as a living system of itself, which, is, which uh, prioritizes its own self-preservation uh, above anything else. So I was just wondering if you have Would any thoughts on uh, systems biologists uh, <laughs> as to if that even has any relevance or is a possibility or if it's just people acting in their interests. Uh, yeah, I think that there's definitely some you know, group think that and making people want to protect this ideology and really punish anyone that tries to veer away from it and sacrifice the one to protect the ideology. And so it is really dangerous. And it's not necessarily individuals acting it only in their self-interest. You know, at least uh, it doesn't seem like it always. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm hoping to have a panel with you and Mr. Damore, if you're available, it'd be awesome to have a, a real diverse panel in a, in a circular fashion where there's not this power, you're, you guys are high, you have microphones, we don't. Um, there are, there's a lot of viewpoints that you didn't discuss tonight and... Um, He's going back, so you can speak to his agent about it. The only reason that I'm high, I'm high. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see it now, it's going to be memed out. No, the, the only reason I'm up here and not down there, we're, because we, we were already limited. We wanted to move this to the ballroom, but security, and I'm not dissing security, you're wonderful. So can but I schedule an told us, with but, you? But I want to say that, that there's, we're not up here because we think we're better than anybody. We're up here because this would, this would have taken seats up. But it's just perpetuating the, the status quo and the hierarchy. No, it's visual. It's how, are you gonna, how are we going to get people in the room if there are no seats? About 90% of us are down here. We don't Okay, well, that's why we said we are more than happy. James Lindsay's right there. Are you saying you don't Helen, want to have an event? Helen, I'll just schedule it myself with someone if you else. Want to call, if you want to call <laughs> James's agent, you are 100%. No, you. I'm I, well, here on campus with you, a roundtable thing where we have the viewpoints that we're not discussing up are there. Are you in the gender studies department here? I've been... Not only was I here at PSU, but I continued those studies outside on my own dime for years. So yes, I can. I can. We, okay, I can well, why don't you come to our? Why don't you come to our Monday thing, our Monday event, and then we'll we'll have a conversation. Or why don't you email me, and we can follow okay, up. Okay, thank you. All right, all right, everyone. Thank you to Andy No for putting on the event. <laughs> Andy did a great job. Thank you to Portland State University. Thank you to Helen, James, and Heather. We really appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. And thank you all for civil discourse. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.